It's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia, and around the world, it's time for Live Aid. They called it the greatest show on earth. 58 bands across the globe playing live in a 16-hour music marathon. It raised millions for the starving in Africa and put governments around the world to shame. But it was the day they thought would never happen. When they told me about it, I thought, what a terrible idea. Well, I burst out laughing. I said, don't be ridiculous. Not least because its creator was an unlikely hero, a foul-mouthed fading pop star. No, let's pop the address. Let's get the numbers. <laughs> It didn't strike me as a man searching around, you know, for a charitable role. Oh, is that a live aid or I'll join the Citizens Advice Bureau? Yet he became the people's champion. He will never ever be able to lose the St. Bob tag. And the tormentor of world-class superstars. You don't say no to Bob. Ah, oh, they're fucking that shit, oh, Jesus Christ, you know. Real good Irish passion coming at you. And if he doesn't get you with the poetry, uh, the spittle isn't far behind. <laughs> From the start, Live Aid was dogged by transatlantic rivalry. America was horrendous. Sabotage. There was a spin put out. You're either being used, or people are going to make a lot of money off you, or it's not going to happen. And superstar egos. What the fuck do you think you're doing? I don't even speak to him. I'm not going to do it. Many predicted catastrophe. It looked like it would be a chaotic disaster. Yet the skeptics would end up falling over themselves to get on board. Let's not lie, don't tell me there was one act there that wasn't aware that there would be more than a billion people watching. It was a day many will never forget. Everyone remembers where they were. Everyone remembers what they felt about it. Everybody, it seems, except those who were there. I think we went on oh, first, didn't we? Right. Yeah, it must have been. Great. First. Yeah, because obviously it was still daylight, wasn't it? Don't even remember that. Did we go in a helicopter? Did we? I just wish I could remember more than I can. Um, but that's because, as I said, I had a bloody good time. For 16 hours, the country was united with joy and reduced to tears. Against all the odds, it was the day that music changed the world. December 1984, and a now familiar anthem was taking Britain by storm. It's Christmas time. In Africa, an aid worker and a journalist heard the song for the first time. Stupid song and a stupid name for it, and how dare this guy make money out of poor, starving people in Ethiopia? I thought it was crap. Um, you know, I thought it was tried. I just thought, you know. What a load of drug taking, cocaine snorting, bonking pop singers got to do with all this. They're just doing it for their careers. The whole thing is, uh, is, is, uh, is bollocks, really. I was busting my guts out to try and save these kids, and I thought somebody was taking advantage of, of them. It wasn't true, but you could hardly blame them for being cynical. This was not a time of peace and brotherly love. There was massive industrial change going on. Um, the community I represented up in County Durham was basically losing all its old coal, steel industries. And so it, it was a big uh, moment of change in the country. Inner cities burst into flames. Unemployment was rife. Left-wing councils and the country's most powerful union, the miners, were locked in a fight to the death with Mrs. Thatcher's Tory government. And there was no greater anarchist than Scargill. So was Derek Hatton in Liverpool. The madness of the loony left. Arthur Scargill, for me, became a tune-out human being. If he came onto the TV, I just turned it off. If you saw police on horseback, you thought, they don't know what they're up against. As far as the black community were concerned, we definitely felt that we were not a part of Thatcher's New Britain. 
we certainly got a sense that it was OK to be racist. There don't seem to be violence everywhere. And in football, we had, of course, the, the violence, the football fans, that the whole country was on edge and everybody's, you know, knocking hell out of each other. But some were doing very nicely out of Mrs. Thatcher. In the cocooned world of Poch, it was limos, larger-than-life hair, and loads of money. The weird thing about Mrs. Thatcher was that even though we hated her, we were all getting rich because of her. I was earning lots of money. That was the time. It was the heart of Thatcherism. Those few years, there was a lot of me, me, me going on, and, and money was king. Everything was larger than life. The shoulder pads were larger than life. The way that we drank and the way that we did things was excessive. This was big hair, a go-go. Wow. The mullets and pop music had never felt so vapid. One singer as well known for his bad hair and big mouth as his hit records was Bob Geldof, frontman of the Boomtown Rats. I mean, I thought the Boomtown Rats were just crap, but, and, you know, and he can't sing. By 1984, the hits and the money were drying up. I was a fading pop singer, certainly fading, no longer relevant. Dying on his feet, we got to a stage where we made, we were thinking, well, we'll let him make one more record and we'll see how this goes. I think we all felt he rather overstayed his welcome and shot his mouth off. And we felt to some extent, I think, that he was a pop star on the slide. Geldof's girlfriend, Paula Yates, presenter of cult music show The Tube, was now the biggest star. Bob occasionally hung around, you know, the, the dressing rooms of the canteen at Tiny's Television when the tube was being shot, like a big bad smell. And he always used to wear a big black leather coat and a, and a hat just that said, you know, I'm a pop star. And he was so grumpy and horrible. I mean, everybody in Bob's world was a fucking bastard. You know, maybe with the exception of his, of his partner and his daughter. So he wasn't that popular. People used to be very cruel to him and call him Mr. Paula Yates and everything, and I could see that hurt him. But one autumn evening, Bob Geldof's life was about to change. October makes me miserable anyway. Um, twilight makes me very uncomfortable. Around 4, four o'clock, 4.15, and autumn days are... You know, the orange sodium lights flick on. Don't like it. So I came in, so the time of day, the sense, though I wouldn't acknowledge it, that this was over and the panic about what do I do, you know? I really can't do anything else in my life. Paula was in and Fifi was in. She was just very small. The three of us watched the six o'clock news. The news featured a report from famine-struck Ethiopia. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Coram, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. The scenes were absolutely riveting. And this, from the get-go, did not look like television. It looked like Spartacus, something vast. And it was grey, these grey wraiths moving in this grey moonscape. And the camera was pitiless. It was like a cyclops just there. It would not let you off the hook. The Red Cross have picked out 500 mothers and children out of the thousands and are treating them in an improvised shelter. It's run by an Anglo-Swiss nurse from Hertfordshire. She has to choose who amongst the hundreds who camp outside should be let in, which babies will be saved. Hold on, what's this guy, what's that, what's that person doing there, that young girl in this? Horror, you know, what's why does she have to decide who lives and dies? 
I feel terrible because it's sending them to a certain death. It, it's terrible. I can take just, just what we can. 21 years on, the same nurse recalls her dilemma. I tried to look at every child, but not stopping too much, because if you stop too much, they just used to throw the child at you or, you know, plead too much. And that was heartbreaking for me. I think I marked their forehead or their hand with a piece of charcoal, the ones we took in. And we didn't take the worst ones, because the worst ones we knew they would die. But making that decision day after day, does that do anything too? Yes, of course it does. What do you expect? Yes, of course it does. It breaks my heart. It reminded me of a Nazi in a concentration camp, sending the people to the death camp. You can come in, you're okay, you're good, you're good, you're good, but you rest, you know, you know you're going to die. You know, it, it really, that's what I remember. I remember feeling so bad about the ones I couldn't help. By quorum standards, it wasn't a bad night, 37 dead. Tomorrow, there would be more. The day after, more still. The context of home, here we all were. Cozy, how do I keep this going? And cozy and this, cozy and this? It wasn't just Bob Geldof. The whole country was shocked. People in Britain are donating about £100,000 a day to help the, the famine relief victims. The agencies who are trying to cope with the famine have been inundated today with offers of help from the public. The Save the Children Fund alone received over a thousand calls by midday. I was just watching that Ethiopian thing. This, I think this is gross after coming out after seeing that. Oh, yeah. I'm serious. There are a lot of people eating a lot of food. So, sorry, do you have any champagne? Well, I've limited myself to two sausages as a result. Tortured by what he'd seen, Geldof hit upon an idea to raise money the only way he could, by making a record. Did you fucking see that thing on TV <laughs> last night? Did you fucking see that? And he was, and he was on, on the phone and he says, you've got to do something about it. We've really got to do something about it. And, 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 and you just, I was on the phone and I just said, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, whatever, whatever you say, Bob. He got lucky. He roped in his friend, songwriter and producer Midge Yo from the chart-topping band Ultravox. To make it big, he needed big stars, but some of them were suspicious. When Bob Conner, he's the last person in the world who'd be talking about this kind of thing. Is that the chimes of doom I pulled off? I thought he was one of the greatest rock and roll stars ever. But the idea of pasta, the, uh, the plate, uh, was not something I'd associate with him. But he has, you know, as you know, he's remarkable verbal skills. And, and if he doesn't get you with the poetry, uh, the spittle isn't far behind. It's half ten, you lazy f I was really suspicious when he first rang about Band-Aid. I was going, this is odd. Why would Geldof be doing this? There must be something in it for him. You can't blame someone for being mildly suspicious. <laughs> try, and, try and marry these two images of a man who cared desperately and passionately about starving people in Africa and this other big, you know, bad-tempered git who swore at everybody. He's got this drive, this mad ambition to get this thing done. Even further back than that, though, I think. He's like a terrier. You know, he will not let go. And once he had been let loose and, and got hold of all these artists, while I'm trying to put the record together, he's getting all the artists together, running up my telephone bill, I have to tell you. We both assumed the role, you know. I was the producer. I was the guy dealing with the music. He was the guy rounding up the crowd. There's no question if Midge just let it all pass, that would have been the end of my involvement and the record would not have been made without him. Geldof and Midge hope to raise £72,000 for Africa but do they know it's Christmas surpass their wildest dreams making more than £8 million as it swept into the charts at number one. They set up a special trust to distribute the money.